Okay, first off, just pet beef. Don't be the person that's like, ah, oh, CRISPR, CRISPR. Like there's people that just like walk around and they're like, ah, oh, just do it with CRISPR, CRISPR. Don't be that person, okay? Um, I'll tell you why the CRISPR-Cas9 stuff is cool and why it's useful, but it's not useful for everything. You don't just be like, yeah, just do the CRISPR. Don't be that person. Uh, and you'll see why, like for some things it's super useful, but for other things, it doesn't make sense to use it. It doesn't make sense to use it in all cases. Um, and there's ageless technology that we still use that in some cases is better. So like, I know you guys kind of probably know, like you could probably, you can use CRISPR and Cas9 techniques to insert stuff into genomes. That's true. But like, would you use CRISPR-Cas9 to insert something into a yeast genome? No, because like we already know how to do that and it's way easier to just do it with like a standard integration with a plasma that I, got, that I already taught you guys. So basically what I'm saying is that there are some huge benefits and some huge advances that the system conveys, but that it, it's not always the best way. Okay, so that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest misconceptions is it's easy to catch people who are kind of ignorant on it when they just are like, yeah, just do that with CRISPR. And it's like, well, actually, there's a better way to do that. And you'll see why. Okay, but in some cases, it is the best thing to use. And it is, it's just a new, it's like a new technique that everybody's going to have to know. It's like PCR. So you do, you will hear it all the time because it's like, it's just this, now it's just a standard molecular biology method that everybody will use from now on. Okay. Okay, so I think it's important to point out that the CRISPR-Cas9 systems, they are immunity systems of bacteria. So just like the restriction enzymes and just like the RNAi systems that we talked about, these are sort of genetic immunity systems that protect cells from invaders. So CRISPR systems are native to bacteria. Okay, so if here's a bacteria. These bacteria are perpetually attacked and invaded by their oldest enemy viruses, bacteriophages. Okay, and when a bacteriophage attacks, it injects its genome. Okay, and how the bacteria protect themselves is over the course of evolutionary time, they steal little snippets of these viral genomes and they incorporate them into their genome. Okay, so that's what I drew with these little pieces up here. Okay, so they steal little pieces of bacteriophage genomes and they stick them into their genome. And these are what are phrased to as the cluster regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Okay, these are little repeats of vi old virus genomes that previously attacked them. Okay, when a virus now attacks them, if they've got a little chunk of that virus genome in their genetic repertoire, they can use that as a targeting system to target the genome of that, vi of that virus for degradation. And the way that they do that is they synthesize little pieces of RNA that correspond to those little regions that match. So again, very similar to RNAi in the sense that there's little, little RNA regions that match the virus genome. Then the Cas9 enzyme, which is a nuclease, couples with these, okay, couples with these homing RNAs, and they're able to find the genome of the virus and degrade it before it causes problems, okay? So the CRISPR-Cas9 system is inherently an immunity system. Now in the wild, so in a bacteria, wild bacteria where that has a CRISPR system, there's four components of the system. One, there's a CRISPR RNA, what's called the CRRNA, the CRISPR RNA. That's that little region that matches the virus genome, okay? So that's that little region that's been stolen over evolutionary time from the viruses and incorporated into the bacterial genome, which can match the virus genome. That's the CRISPR RNA. Two, then there's a transactivating CRISPR RNA. Okay, this is called the tracer RNA. Tracer RNA. 
The role of the tracer RNA is that it serves as an intermediary linking the guide, the, not the guide RNA, but linking the CRISPR RNA above, it links that through this intermediary, which is the tracer RNA, to the Cas9 enzyme. Okay, so the CRISPR RNA itself, by itself, doesn't naturally have a means to bind to the Cas9. It uses what's called the transactivating CRISPR RNA to form the duplex with the Cas9 RNA. Okay, so in the wild, there's actually a couple different pieces of this. And then, even then, it's not, it's not ready for activity yet. Three, it needs to be matured. So little pieces of these RNA segments need to be cut off so that it's kind of like tweaked, optimized by an enzyme called RNase 3. So RNase 3 matures the complex or the duplex. And then four, the Cas9 nuclease, the nuclease, which is the protein, okay? So one important point is this whole complex of a couple different pieces of RNA which have been matured and then bound to a protein. This is called an RNP complex, the ribo, oh shit, not ribo. Yeah, ribonucleoprotein complex. Ribonucleoprotein complex. Or what you'll hear as RNP, or you'll read this in papers, RNP. That means it's a Cas9 enzyme. It's a protein, Cas9, bound to the uh, bound to the RNAs that it needs to make it to make it work. So historically, um, one of the important points of CRISPR is that it's been taken from this initial phase where it was an immunity system. And it's been re-engineered now to be a tool of molecular biology, okay? And one of the reasons why it wasn't so convenient a tool initially was that you have these little different pieces of the RNA. So you had the tracer RNA, and I told you that the tracer RNA was this little sequence that was, that formed a duplex to the Cas9 enzyme and the CRISPR RNA. And the CRISPR RNA was like the guide. That was like the homing mechanism. But the tracer RNA was sort of like the link between the Cas9 actual enzyme and the RNA. So right now in this piece, there were three pieces, plus you needed that RNAs three to mature these things for it to get it to work. So there's kind of a lot of components, a lot of working pieces, functioning, um, moving parts in this system. So genetic engineers and Jennifer Dudna's lab have re-engineered this to be a lot more simplistic. So they built what's called the gRNA. And now when you read papers in molecular biology in CRISPR, you don't really see CRISPR RNA or tracer RNA. You don't really see these terms anymore. What you see is guide RNA. Guide RNA, okay? And the, or gRNA. And the guide RNA is actually a fusion. So it's like, it's just like they learned how the system works and then they just built a system where the tracer RNA was fused to the guide RNA in a way that was included in an ORF such that this thing could just be expressed as one piece that would then bind to the Cas9 and it was ready to go. So they reduced the things that you need from essentially four, the Cas9, the tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA, and then that RNAs three maturase. Okay, they reduce the amount of components from four to essentially two. So to get CRISPR to work in a molecular biology sense and like in the lab, in the test tube, in the cell, now what we're doing are two component systems which include a guide RNA and a Cas9 enzyme. Okay, so that's a very, very important point that distinguishes the CRISPR systems that are being used in the test tube from the CRISPR systems that were the original bacterial immunity systems. So here's an actual picture of a synthesized fused guide RNA, which has taken the CRISPR RNA and fused it to the tracer RNA, okay? And here is the homing beacon, the guide the that's guiding towards the genomic target. Here, what you're seeing is it's bound to the Cas9 protein, okay? And it's interfacing with the Cas9 protein in this loop right here. 
And then this is the tracer RNA region. Okay. So now one important part to add to this discussion is that since we are making fusion guide RNAs, these are synthetic constructs that we've built. What you might already be realizing is that this is now customizable. This is a customizable homing nuclease. And the way that we customize it is by altering this region right here, which guides towards the genomic target. So if we want to cut or snip any region in the genome with this nuclease, we can change this region of RNA so that it matches a region that we want to cut and then it will cause the Cas9 enzyme to be targeted towards that region, find it, and cut it in a customizable fashion. So essentially, the take home message that you want to realize is that the Cas9 system itself, the Cas9 enzyme, is a homing nuclease that can be guided towards a region of the DNA that you want to cut. But let me ask you a question. Is the Cas9 enzyme protein by itself sequence specific? No, that's what the guide RNA is. Right. So the guide RNA is what provides the specificity to the Cas9. Okay, so let me just talk more about Cas9. Okay. Um, there's many different Cases. Okay. So Cas is a nuclease that's associated with this CRISPR system. And there's many different kinds of bacteria, right? And e many of these bacteria all have kind of evolved pyrologous, orthologous, homologous systems, okay? So you can find many different Cas9, what would be, I guess, orthologs or homologs, okay? And each of these have little subtle differences. And oftentimes you'll see something like this, SP Cas9. What does that mean? Yeah, so this, this if you see, if you ever see this, and it might not be SP, it might be something different. But if you ever see this, they're telling you where the Cas9 is from. So I'm going off memory here. I think it's this is like Streptococcus pyogenes or so, it's something like that. But this is a common one, the SP. If you read papers, when you read, I think when we read the in the lab today, when you read the Nix paper, I think they're using the SP. So this is very, very common. And you'll see this. And there's some that are better than others for certain contexts. So you will see people mix and match with different Cas9s, preferably for whatever function they want to use, whatever they want to do. And it's expanding so much now that people, like it's expanding, expanding so fast and it's so popular that if even if I were to like talk about a bunch of specificities today, it'd be different two years from now. So like just I'm just teaching you guys like the basics. And then 10 years from now, stuff that falls out is what you're going to want to know. OK, so let's talk about Feng Zhang's role in all of this. So I specifically use this example at the very beginning of class because it's a great example. Um, and the context I gave it was in the very first lecture, I talk about having a, a a geographical sense of the cell is very important, okay? Having a geographical sense of where things are, like mitochondria or nucleus or cytoplasm, and being able to traffic things, proteins, to do activities and behaviors in particular regions of the cell is extremely important in a biotechnology sense. Because if you want to accomplish something, you have to be able to send or target a molecule there to that exact geographical space to be able to do something. Okay, so Feng Zhang's role in the CRISPR-Cas9 research, I mean, and it's been, it's, it's become much, much broader than this since then, but his original role was in modification of, of human cells. So imagine now, um, imagine you want to take the Cas9 nuclease and you want to use it with guide RNA, and you want to use it to modify a eukaryotic cell. One of the problems that you're going to encounter is that the Cas9 enzyme itself is from bacteria, and bacteria don't have nuclei. 
they're prokaryotes, okay? They're not eukaryotes, and by definition, they don't have nuclei. So the Cas9 enzyme itself is was not first programmed to be able to make modifications in eukaryotic cells because if you were to express the Cas9 enzyme in a eukaryotic cell, it would just sit in the cytoplasm. And where its behavior is would be on the chromosomes in the nucleus. And there's a wall there. There's a wall there called the nuclear membrane, okay? And so unless you program the Cas9 to go into the nucleus and behave and act as a nuclease inside the nucleus, you're not gonna get any activity. So what Feng Zhang did was he took the Cas9 gene and he fused a nuclear localization signal to it, such that when you now express the Cas9 in a eukaryotic cell, the nuclear localization signal takes it into the nuclease, a nucleus and now allows it to act as a nuclease, a guided homing nuclease to cut regions of eukaryotic DNA, okay? So that is Feng Zhang's role in the Cas9, in the original Cas9 research. So what can we use CRISPR-Cas9 systems for? Okay, because it's a nuclease and because it's homing, we can use it to, in a targeted fashion, cleave DNA. And the result of that cleavage is gonna be different things under different contexts, okay? So it cuts DNA. But the downstream result of that cutting is going to be different depending on the context. So we can use it for targeted knockouts. So if there's a specific gene you want to knock out, we can knock it out. We can also cause insertions or deletions. So if you ever see indels, that stands for insertions or deletions. We can use it to cause insertions or deletions at the site of the cut. Um, but these, again, in insertion or deletion, sort of rely on different features of the cell, which I'm going to talk about now. So in this class, in the past, I have gone over multiple DNA repair pathways. And I've gone over these in different contexts, including recombination, recombinering, things like that. But now these really come into play with, with CRISPR-Cas9. Because you can imagine if the Cas9 enzyme is a nuclease that cuts DNA, you can imagine that now if the DNA is cut in a cell, that's an abnormal feature and the cell needs to try to fix that. So CRISPR-Cas9 systems engineer via sort of manipulations in the repair pathways of cells. And we've talked about two major repair pathways, okay? We've talked about non-homologous end joining, so I'll write that out, non-homologous end joining, and I've also called this blunt end repair, and usually how I describe this is it's when you have a double-stranded break, so if you ever see DSB, that's a double-stranded break. If you have a double-stranded break in the DNA, sometimes the cell has mechanisms where it can literally just take these ends and smash them together. And that um, can cause a deletion. If, if something were to fall out of this little piece and you sort of smash it together at the wrong points, you can get deletions, which can cause problems for the cell, okay? That's non-homologous end joining, where it just takes two ends and smashes them together. The other side of the coin is repair pathways can follow homology directed repair. Okay, so I'll write this out. Homology directed repair. Okay, and so this is where, this is where if there's a double stranded break, the cell looks for a second copy and then it can sort of find and intercalate with that second copy and can repair perfectly that site, which was a double-stranded break by direction from a homologous region of DNA, okay? These are the two separate repair pathways in the cell that are important for your understanding of the CRISPR-Cas9 DNA manipulation. So let's talk about a deletion with Cas9. How would you do a deletion, a deletion with the CRISPR-Cas9 system? So imagine you had a string of DNA, okay? And imagine here is your ORF, 
orf x. And you want to try to cause a deletion in orf x. You want to knock this out for a particular reason. You're studying orf x and you want to see what happens to the cell when you delete it. Okay. So one of the things that you can do is you can target Cas9 enzymes to orf x by designing the guide RNA to have a sequence of homology at ORF X. Then what's going to happen is the guide RNA is going to track your Cas9 enzyme to the ORF X DNA region, and then the Cas9 is going to clip it, causing a double stranded break. Okay. Now what's the result of that? So the result of that is going to be that now at that site, in the middle of ORFX, you have a break in the DNA. Okay. So the cell then is going to have to try to repair that. And oftentimes when it does the blunt end repair, it seeks to smash these ends together. And when that happens, sometimes there's a, sometimes there's a mistake and sometimes little pieces, maybe an A, maybe a T, maybe a little, a little region, a little fragment of a couple base pairs. Sometimes they just fall out. Okay. And when this smashes together, then what happens is what you, your resulting product might be now a little bit different. It might be ORF X. Okay. But Orfex might now have a deletion of a couple base pairs, deletion of maybe an A and a T. And the result of that dilution, deletion of that A and T is now a frame shift. Okay, so you can imagine now what's being produced from this Orfex is a messenger RNA that is in the wrong frame. So when the ribosome comes on here and tries to read it and translate it into a protein, once it gets to the point of that deletion where those couple base pairs are deleted, it's now translating the wrong protein. It's translating a, a, a junk garbage sequence, a random sequence that doesn't mean anything. So what will happen is it will cause this protein, usually in most contexts, to be non-functional. Okay, so this is sort of a, a deletion, a deletion of ORF X. Now it's not a complete deletion of ORF X because you still have the ORF in the genome. It's just mutated in a way where the protein is junk. Okay, so that's one sort of version of a type of deletion you can cause with CRISPR-Cas9 systems. Now let's talk about how we can actually do a legitimate complete deletion. So let's go back up to the original example. Imagine you want to delete ORF X, you, but this time you want to delete the entire thing. You want to get rid of the entire sequence. You don't just want to cause a mutation and that causes results in a non-functional protein. You literally want to get rid of the entire sequence out of the genome. Okay, so what you can do is you can provide multiple, this is called multiplexing, multiplexing. You can provide multiple guide RNAs, okay? So let's say you provide one guide RNA that hits the start codon, okay? So it's gonna be targeting, this guide RNA is gonna be targeting right here, okay? And then let's pr say you provide a second guide RNA, which is gonna target the stop codon, okay? So the second guide RNA is gonna complex with the Cas9, and it's gonna target the stop codon. Now what's going to happen as a result, okay? So now you're going to get two cuts. I should draw this better. You're going to get two cuts. One at the start codon. One at the stop codon. Okay? And now the cell is going to try to have to repair these DNA sequences. And sometimes what's going to happen is if it does blunt end repair, it's going to take this end right here, and this end right here and smash them together and you'll get a complete deletion of this region right here, which it missed. Now it's not always going to do that. Sometimes it's going to take 
and repair it perfectly. Sometimes it's gonna take this region and put it together, and it's gonna take this region and put it together, okay? And then what you'd get is a perfect recapitulation of your Orfex. So in that case, it wouldn't have worked. So that's an important point, is that when you do CRISPR-Cas9, you're usually generating multiple mutants, multiple in a sense that you're looking and you're analyzing, you're doing the experiment, and then the output of that experiment may be five to 20 mutants. And then you need to sequence the genetic region where those mutants were being targeted to figure out which of those one to N mutants is actually a complete deletion. You're not gonna get the result that you want 100% of the time, okay? But these are examples through which you can use CRISPR to either cause a, a non-functional protein to be produced, so a deletion in the sense that you've messed up the protein, or you can delete the entire genetic sequence based on multiplexing the guide RNAs. Okay, now let's talk about an insertion with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So imagine you now have, here's your ORF-X right here. Here's the start codon, here's the stop codon. And imagine you have a scenario where you wanna add a tag, an epitope tag on the end terminus of the protein. Okay, how are you gonna do that with CRISPR? Well, what you can do is you can take the Cas9 and you can complex it with a guide RNA whose targeting region attacks that start codon. Okay, so let's say it matches the start codon. And then what you're gonna, what that's gonna yield is the guide RNA will target the Cas9 to that start codon and you'll get a cut, okay, right at that start codon. So here's your Orfex. And let's say this was your ATG, you got a cut right there just before separating it from its promoter region. Okay. Now imagine you have this. If you want to do an insertion there, you can use the CRISPR-Cas9 to insert something if you direct the cell towards homology directed repair. Okay. So that's the repair pathway where the cell's going to look for a homologous region of DNA to intercalate and repair this broken double-stranded break. And the only way that you can do that is if you provide a template. Okay, so imagine you not only mixed this cell with the key ingredient of the Cas9 gRNA ribonucleoprotein complex, that's ingredient one, the RNP. Ingredient two is a template to repair off. So imagine you built a plasmid, okay? And your plasmid, in your plasmid, you had cloned in ORF-X. And you had previously built a tag, an N-terminal tag that you want. Let's say it's a His tag. His 6 to ORF-X. Right there. So this is a plasmid. Now imagine when you provide the Cas9 protein, the ribonucleoprotein complex, imagine you also provide a bunch of this plasmid into the cell. So you micro-inject and you micro-inject your ribonucleoprotein complex mixed with a bunch of this plasmid. Now what the cell's gonna do is it's gonna try to go through, it's gonna either make a decision, is it gonna do blunt end repair or is it gonna do homology directed repair? If there's a bunch of templates that match your ORF-X, for instance, you provided these templates in abundant concentration from your plasmid that you also micro-injected, then the cell might see this and it might think, okay, well, I'm gonna do homology directed repair because here's a perfect template that I can repair off. Then your DNA is gonna intercalate into your plasmid and through the DNA repair pathways using homology, it's gonna repair that double-stranded break and the resulting product is gonna be repaired with the insert that you built into your plasmid. So now what's going to be the result is ORF-X with your HIS-6 tag attached on the N-terminus just like you wanted, okay? But I want to reiterate that the efficiency by which this happens, this repair pathway, 
is not 100%. You're going to have to make a series of 1 to N clones where you do utilize this technique, you isolate certain clones that come out of this, and then you sequence them to verify which of these have actually been repaired to your desired sequence. Okay, and it's not going to be all of them. It might be only be one out of 10. Maybe it's only one out of 20. Maybe it's only one out of 50. But this is a this is a way in which that you can do this and you can you can change the DNA. Okay, so let me just reiterate in summation. The two things you can do with CRISPR Cas9 is you can do targeted mutation. And that is sort of induced by cutting the DNA at a targeted sequence. The second thing you can do is targeted insertion. And this is only generated by, by adding an additional piece, which is not only do you have to add the RNP, RNP, but you also have to add a template for repair. Okay. So do you see how these two methods are different? Method one, targeted mutation, you only need to provide the RNP. And it's gonna target that genetic site and cut it. The second thing, insertion, is different in that you have to, it's a little bit more complicated. You have to also add a template for the repair, okay? And these are the things that you can do with CRISPR. Now this is a good time to talk about really the power of CRISPR. Why is it so popular? Why is it so, um, pervasive and why is it why is everybody talking about it well before this okay so for instance in my system of insects okay so I study insects prior to CRISPR Cas9 genetic manipulation of some insects was easy so like Drosophila was easy because that was so well studied people knew how to do it but the problem with the genetic modification of Drosophila, so that's like P-element transposons, VIC31 integrase, stuff like that. The problem with that stuff is that you can't take it from Drosophila and always apply it to any insect you wanted. So if you were studying Drosophila, you were good. But if you were studying, say, mosquitoes or tsetse flies or kissing bugs, something different, you were sort of shit out of luck because that stuff, the stuff that worked in Drosophila doesn't necessarily work in the kissing bug or the tsetse fly, etc. So one of the great things about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is that it seems to work in all organisms. So now not only can you use it, say, a CRISPR system in Drosophila, but you could also use a CRISPR system in the kissing bug or in the mosquito or and in many different species of mosquito, okay? So one of the good things about the CRISPR-Cas9 system is it seems to be a platform technology. That means that it's cross applicable to many different situations, okay? And that was not prior the case in biotechnology. Previously, what had to happen is there had to be intensive study in a particular insect to identify a particular transposon which could be used to insert something, okay? And that took years, 10, 10 decades to do that. Now we can just take this one technology and we can know that it, it always works in sort of all, it seems to work in all eukaryotic systems. So it's cross applicable. And that's why it's so useful and so pervasive. Okay, so let's talk about one of the problems with CRISPR, Cas9. Why are people so concerned about this? And what is some of the scenarios where you try to do something, but you don't actually get what you want? Well, one of these scenarios, okay, which you want to become familiar with is called off-target effects. This is where you're trying to do something and what you're trying to do actually happens, but also what happens is a bunch of other stuff, which you weren't predicting, okay? These are off-target effects. So you've heard of these in, in my biotechnology class with respect to insecticides, okay? If you treat a particular insect and with an insecticide, you might get a good result of killing that insect, but maybe you get a bad off-target effect where it's also killing bees, okay? That's a classical example of an off-target effect. CRISPR-Cas9, a lot of the research has been focused on reducing 
the off-target effects. Okay, so let me just describe what an off-target effect would be in the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So Cas9, what type of enzyme is that? Okay, it's a nuclease. Okay, that means it cuts DNA. We've talked, we've hammered that multiple, multiple times. So is it a problem when you take a Cas9 nuclease and you express it in an organism whose blueprint for how to survive is a nucleic acid? Okay, what I'm saying is you're taking an you're taking an enzyme that cuts DNA and you're expressing it in an organism, and that or the way that that organism survives is by maintaining the integrity of its nucleic acids. Okay, so what an off-target effect would be would be imagine you designed a guide RNA, and here's your targeting sequence right here, and let's say you were targeting towards ORF X. What if in the genome of that eukaryotic organism where you were trying to manipulate ORF X? What if there was a second sequence that was very similar to ORF X? We'll call it ORF X 2.0. Okay, let's say somewhere else, somewhere else in the genome, far, far away from ORF X, there's a little sequence of DNA that mimics ORF X, ORF X 2.0. It's the same. It's very, very similar in genetic sequence. That means the base pairs are very, are very similar. So not only what you're going to get is you're not only going to get that Cas9 is cleaving ORFX like you wanted, it's also going to be cleaving this other thing which you might not have been aware of, ORFX 2.0. And if that happens, maybe the result of what you're getting is not what you wanted because maybe this will result in death. So you can imagine what you can imagine the ethical question of should we be genetically engineering human babies? So let's say in the Chinese example where the Chinese scientists engineered uh, a human baby to be resistant to the AIDS virus by targeting a particular receptor that the AIDS virus uses to invade a cell, and they made mutations in this receptor such that they the virus, the HIV virus, can no longer invade those cells. One of the things that we worry about is what if that what if that Cas9 enzyme also mutated some other gene in that genome which gave that human baby a, a terrible disease, okay? That would be a terrible off-target effect. That would be a terrible result of us trying to do good but actually ended up ending up creating something worse. So that's a classical example of an off-target effect. And so in Cas9 and CRISPR-Cas9 research, there's been a lot of research on sort of detecting off-target effects, looking through the genome to see what these Cas9 enzymes are also cleaving besides the target, and engineering new Cas9 enzymes to have high, high fidelity. Okay, so I hope what I have conveyed in this lecture is the basic premise of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. What you want to remember is that this is a system that has multiple parts, okay? You have the Cas9 enzyme, which is a protein that cuts DNA. It's a nuclease. And that nuclease is, homed, is, is homing, it has a homing mechanism based on a guide RNA that you provide. That guide RNA is the product of a fusion, a biotechnolog biotechnolog biotechnological fusion of the CRISPR, RNA and the tracer RNA, okay? And those were originally from the original CRISPR systems, which were bacterial immunity systems, which were defenses against viruses. And we can use now this duplexed Cas9 guide RNA ribonuclear protein complex for a couple things. We can use it for insertions. We can use it for deletions. And one of the reasons it's so useful is because it seems to work in all eukaryotic organisms. Okay, so I hope I've conveyed that. In the next lecture, we're going to talk a lot about delivering these components to insect germline systems for transgenic modification of insects. And we'll talk about some of the problems and issues associated with that and some of the successes in the next lecture. Have a good day.